Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk from the online seminar series Progress and Visions in the Scientific Study of the Mind-Matter Relation, held in 2018. The seminars aim to bring together researchers from around the globe with a background in mathematics or physics who are interested in the scientific study of consciousness and the mind-matter relation. While each seminar session consists of a talk and a discussion, the latter is not recorded and the following video will only contain the talk. We hope you enjoy it. For further information, please visit mind-matter-relation.org. Okay, so now let's actually start with the session. So I don't really have to say much about Lou since many of you know him anyway. For those who don't know him, I, I'm just going to say some words. Um, so first of all, most important um, thing is he's a mathematician. He's currently an emeritus professor of mathematics at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And his primary work has been and still is on knot theory and its connection to other parts of mathematics, for example, to statistical mechanics, to quantum theory, to algebra, or to combinatorics. He has also done a lot of research in cybernetics and in foundations of mathematics and foundations of physics. And his current work still focuses on knot theory, um, but it also focuses on foundations of quantum physics and on quantum computing. And most, of, most important for our interest, it focuses on the understanding of form, eigenform, and reflexive dynamics. So I'm sure some of you have already come across this when being interested in the scientific relation of, uh, of the scientific study of the mind-matter relation, and others will probably see this at some point. Lou has won, very, won many, many awards, and I'm just not going to list them because there are too many um, for a short introduction. And he's the author of four books on knot theory, as well as the editor of a journal and a book series focusing on this part of mathematics. His mathematical achievements have been crowned um, by him becoming a fellow of the American Mathematical Society in 2014. And today we're going to have a talk um, by Lou on the topic sign and space. And with this, I can just say um, thank you very much, Lou, for joining us today and for agreeing to give a talk. And um, I would just pass the virtual microphone over to you at this point. Please go ahead. Thank you, Johannes. It's a pleasure to be able to talk here. Um, uh, you should be looking at my first slide, which is entitled Sign in Space, and uh, it contains some characteristics of the form of this discussion because I, uh, I like cartoons and drawings, and I like to illustrate ideas by using geometrical drawings and, and to use mathematics in a metaphorical way through those drawings. And what you're looking at here um, is a well-known Escher print. Um, and as you see, uh, it consists in a Mobius strip, which has been cut down the middle. That's the largest uh, slit going all the way around. And it, there are also some decorative cuts. Uh, I won't speak about the decorative cuts, but um, you will notice that it is a three half twisted Mobius strip, which has been cut down the middle. And and you'll also notice that it is a knot. Uh, it is a knotted band. Uh, and that is a, a wonderful fact about a three half twisted Mobius band, which if you have never done it uh, with a strip of paper, you should do it. Uh, because it's quite remarkable to see the knot appear uh, in the topological form of the band after you make the cut. Um, I also uh, illustrate a Mobius band because there are many um, epistemological issues that can be illustrated with Mobius bands. Um, for, uh, uh, for example, in this cut Mobius band, there appear locally to be two edges uh, in the gap. Uh, but those edges are actually all part of one edge of the resulting cut band. So it's um, it's two locally and one globally. And, and this uh, idea that um, something might, might um, delicately or subtly vary between being multiple or single uh, is part of the theme that I want to play with. So let's go to the next slide. Um, as I said, I like cartoons, so this is one that I happen to enjoy. I won't make a comment on it. 
except of course i think none of us believe in the homunculus but uh, this is a rabbit homunculus and i rather like him um and then um there is the matter of what brings forth the impression of consciousness or mind uh from a simple drawing uh something i'm curious about for a long time and uh this is an example. Uh, and some of the themes are here as well, because on the one hand, uh, the disc has been cut into two halves, but then each half seems to be in and of itself a face, but then uh, the entire disc can also be thought of as a face. And you tend to shift your attention among these parts in the form of the distinction that you make. Here's the Mobius strip again, an ordinary uh, quarter, uh, I mean, one half turn, uh, twisted Mobius band with one, as you know, one edge and one side. Uh, and, and then many people have, have gotten fascinated with the Mobius band and made sculptures in relation to it or paintings. And I wanted to just insert just a little bit of topological mathematics here in relation to the Mobius span that I happen to like. Uh, I'm proving something here in these arrows which are going around. If you start in the lower left, you see a handle attached to a Mobius span. And both ends of the handle are locally next to one another and on the same local side of the Mobius span. Um, so one can think of this as a torus has interacted with a Mobius band. Um, I wrote uh, sharp uh, for the interaction, um, and it's sometimes called connected sum. But let's just say that the torus interacted with the Mobius band. But then in this sequence of events, one of the handle ends starts walking along the Mobius band, moving continuously. and ends up going all the way around the Mobius band and back to the beginning at the end as you go up around and come down on the lower right. Uh, and now what has happened is that the handle is locally attached again, doesn't need the rest of the Mobius band to be described, but it's attached in a funny way, namely one end of the handle is attached on one local side of the Mobius band and the other end of the handle is attached on the opposite side of the local Mobius band. If we were to do a little more with Mobius bands and Klein bottles and so on, I would explain to you, but I, I shan't with um, images here, that what has happened on the right-hand lower side is that a Klein bottle has interacted with the Mobius band, and that by using the Mobius band as a catalyst, we have effectively turned a torus into a Klein bottle. Uh, it's a bit of the topology of the Mobius band. The Mobius band has a way of controverting a distinction when you go all the way around it. In this case, it controverts the distinction between the torus and the Klein bottle, a fact of surface topology. Well, that controversion leads one to make a cartoon about logic. Uh, here is uh, Epimenides' paradox of the liar. The fictional speaker Epimenides, a Cretan, reportedly stated, the Cretans are always liars. Or to say it formally in sentences, L is identical to not L, um, which is, of course, not quite the same as saying I lie, but coming close to it. And the formalism, I'm aware of this always, that the, when, whenever you shift the formalism a little bit and make it a little more symbolic, you have a tendency to lose some part of the meaning. But we can take it as a kind of cartoon of the liar paradox that it says that L is equal to not L. And then the not could be regarded as the going through the twist. And then uh, in the Mobius band, L becomes equal to not L by the fact that we're twisted and connected back around through the Mobius band. But of course, in the 
topology, there is no paradox. It's only in the interpretation that there's a paradox. In fact, in the topology, there is the flexibility and motion and ability to work with the Mobius band that uh, makes it uh, a mathematical object of study and not a paradox at all. And the same could be true of paradoxes if you take them in the right way. So from the point of view of logic, the liar is in an imaginary state that is neither true nor false. From the point of view of topology, the liar has the shape of a Mobius band. And again, the boundary of the Mobius band is one, and yet it is also two, depending on how you look. Um, here I'm shifting into a um, practical problem that is related to the Mobius band. Um, I think uh, you might find the number of shifts that I make into little sidelines um, curious and maybe a little unnerving. I don't intend to confuse you with these uh, digressions, but I think they're interesting. So here's the, here's the engineering problem, which you may know. Design a switching circuit that can control a single light from an arbitrary number of locations. Now, this can be analyzed by Boolean algebra, um, but uh, I wanted to show you a kind of non-dual solution that is the invention discovery of a cyberneticist named Ricardo Uribe. He saw how to see the solution to this problem at once. Maybe I give you a moment to think about the problem, but not enough time, I'm afraid. Here's his solution. You make a switch which um, either at, which has two lines going in, two, uh, two connecting lines, and two connecting lines going out. And the switch has two states. Either uh, the lines are crossed over, and where they cross over, they do not meet. I've drawn it as a crossover, but they're not supposed to meet. The electrical current could run from the top to the lower top left to the lower right in the crossover switch, and from the uh, lower left to the top upper right without interfering with itself. So the two states are crossed or uncrossed. And as you see, if we made a, a Mobius band and use the wire along the edge of the Mobius band, why then the light would be on where the ends of the light and its power source grapple the two local sides of the Mobius band. But if it was an ordinary band, then the light would not be on because there would be no conductance from one edge, to, from one loop to the other. So then the solution to the problem can be to put as many switches as you like along a band uh, where the band that really has only the edges and and then you see that if you have an odd number of switches in the cross position, the light will be on. And if you have an even number of switches in the cross position, then the light will be off. And if you change any one switch, you will go from parity even to parity odd or parity odd to parity even. And this satisfies the problem in an elegant and simple way. It's actually quite interesting. Uh, to do the Boolean analysis and find where this solution lives there. It lives there, but you might miss it if you're just doing algebra. Now I want to talk about um, a book uh, and the ideas related to that book, um, Laws of Form by G. Spencer Brown. And I didn't mention in the slideshow that many of these ideas are implicit and even explicitly, but with a slightly different formalism in the work of Charles Sanders Peirce uh, earlier than Spencer Brown. But Spencer Brown wrote a very concise and beautiful book uh, related to this, and I don't know that he knew about Peirce's work. So here's a quote or two. The What we're talking about is the idea of a distinction and the act of making a distinction, and what kind of mathematical formalism could arise as close to the notion of distinction as possible. So the first quote is, we take as given uh, the idea of distinction and the idea of indication, and that one cannot make an indication without drawing a distinction. And we take, therefore, the form of distinction 
for the form. The first sentence I think is um, easy to understand and the second one is um, in its form self-referential. We take the form of distinction for the form. But it's a way of uh, encapsulating the question and an answer to what is form. And then below that, I've drawn a simple distinction, a circle in the plane. But for whom and what is this a distinction? Uh, it, uh, it could re be regarded as an objective distinction by those who are familiar with circles. Um, but for a given person who drew the circle or who is observing the circle, it becomes the awareness of the distinction between the inside and the outside of that circle. So that's the beginning. And the circle makes a distinction in the plane. And I put makes in quotes because it doesn't make the distinction. You make the distinction. We make a distinction in the plane by drawing a circle. The circle and the observer arise together in the act of perceiving the circle. And in that sense, that circle, this observer, and the distinction that arises are one. This is a kind of R1, which is like the center core line in the Mobius band is one, and yet it is two if you perturb it a little bit. It is the one of connection. And another thing that Spencer Brown wrote in his book is, the form we take to exist arises from framing nothing. Uh, and I like to illustrate this uh, in various ways. Uh, in my slides, I say we could stop now in the sense that I've told you everything. Um, but I think some of this needs unpacking and relating. Uh, but the purpose of this talk is to look at how, by starting in unity, we can make an imaginary complexity and how that's related to the original unity. Every discrimination is inherently a process. And the structure of our world as a whole comes from the relationships whose exploration constitutes that world. It is a reflexive domain. There is no place to hide in a reflexive domain, no fundamental particle, no irreducible object or building block. Any given entity requires its properties through its relationships with everything else. The talk will trace how a mathematics of distinction arises from the process of discrimination and how that language understood rightly as an opportunity to join as well as to divide can aid in the movement between duality and non-duality. And the purpose of the talk is to express this language and invite your participation in it and to present the possibility that many things are involved in this journey. So let's look at set theory in the light of the form we take to exist arises from framing nothing. And you will see what I mean in a moment. Let me cartoon the empty set by an empty circle. Uh, and I will cartoon then the set whose member is an empty set by a circle inside a circle. And the set whose members are 0 and 1, calling the first two sets 0 and 1. The set whose members are 0 and 1 is thereby the circle surrounding a circle and a circle within a circle. And you'll notice I'm not using commas here. We can discriminate the members of these simple sets without having to use commas. So then the, one, the basic principle for set theory is that two sets are equal if and only if they have the same members. And then you have a basic theorem that there's only one empty set. On the proof, suppose you had two sets that were both empty. Well, then they must be equal because they have the same members, none. Uh, and on the other hand, zero is not equal to one because zero has no members, whereas one has a member, namely zero. Remember one here. And uh, this is the beginning of multiplicity uh, started from framing nothing in the context of elementary set theory. 
these principles generate um, multiplicities of any size you care to. You just keep on going in the same way. Um, empty set, set whose members empty set, set whose members are zero and one. Now you form two, then you form the set whose members are zero, one, and two, and you argue on the basis of the principle of equality that the three is different from zero, one, and two, and so on. Um, so it's quite startling when you begin to think about it, how, uh, how finite multiplicities and then taking it further, infinite multiplicities arise just out of the notion that you can always form a set. You can frame whatever you've built and form a set consisting in them. And as you know, there are some paradoxes in this brew, but uh, those are the basic ideas. Here's three. So I want to think about an initial act of distinction. For the distinction to be distinct, there must be a difference between the sides. And I'm looking at simple, clear distinctions, like drawing a circle in the plane. You can think of ones uh, that are uh, subtler, perhaps. Let us call one side marked and the other side unmarked. And I've indicated that by putting an M on one side and nothing on the other side. And so the distinction is a circle. And why should I use an M? I'm trying to be as economical as possible. I could let the circle itself stand for it's marked outside. And if I did that, then the circle has a name tag in its own form. Uh, in this case, the cartoon and, uh, and the object of that cartoon are identical, except in size and place and the tag and the name of the tag can be confused. So now we have two circles, and one of them is regarded as the name of the other. Or if they are of equal size and indistinguishable in other ways, each could be regarded as the name of the other. And so I don't really need the name tag, not in the conventions of drawing in a plane, to know that I have a circle and there is an outside or an inside. So I have a movement which says, I do not have to call that name twice because the circle calls its own name just by being there. And I can call the name of the circle with something which has the same form as the circle. And so I get two circles could be identified with a single circle. The value of the call of a name made again is the value of the call. We're beginning to evolve a formalism here, not set theoretic. Uh, but using the same cartoons of circles as containers as we did for sets. So this is one rule in the system we're evolving. The value of a call made again is the value of a call. Two circles next to one another can be replaced by a single circle or vice versa. So far, we've focused on the distinction as locations of its sides and their names. But I also shall think of the mark, the circle, the distinction, as a transformation from the state indicated on its inside to the state indicated on the outside. That is, if you have a distinction, it certainly can be thought of as a transformation. It's implicit in the situation that if I think of the distinction between, say, myself and world, then I add in my speaking, the notion of traveling from self to world, or from world to self, or from self to other, and other to self. Once there's a distinction, there is the possibility of moving across from one side of that distinction to another. I almost said across the boundary, but we are cartooning distinctions as though they had perceptible boundaries, and you will notice that that's an extra distinction, the boundary. So I have crossing from the inside is the outside, or crossing from the unmarked is the marked, or crossing from the marked is the unmarked. And now I want to be economical again. And so uh, let's go back to cross from the unmarked state. Well, that's how I'm interpreting the circle on the left. There's nothing inside. It's unmarked. 
And this is the same as what we called the Marx state, the circle itself, designating its outside. And so this equation, which looks like uh, one identical is equal to another, has become interpreted as dynamical on the left and uh, in the form of naming on the right. And they are compatible with one another in the formalism that we are evolving. And then I have cross from the marked state is unmarked. And if I write that literally, I have that two concentric circles could cancel one another to nothing. The value of the crossing made again is not the value of the crossing. And that's the second uh, part of the formalism. Two circles that are concentric to one another can cancel. And so we end up with a formalism of circles circles that are drawn but do not necessarily intersect one do not intersect one another uh, like the set theoretic circles but now we're not interpreting in terms of sets and two next two two empty circles next to one another can cancel down to one condense to one and two concentric circles with the innermost empty disappear or appear so for example, and, and now we're operating the formalism, um, I have a collection of circles here, a nest, um, and uh, the two concentric circles down inside can vanish. And now again, now I have two concentric circles on the right, and they vanish um, once I've seen them as two concentric circles, I redrew it, and I end up with one single circle, a marked state. So I would say that the entity on the left uh, is uh, marked. That's the beginning of the formalism. I won't change it too much from now on. Um, but um, but this formalism uh, is coming just from thinking about how a distinction might be uh, imaged in this way. Uh, and And you see that I can perform operations on the formalism if I wish. So in this slide, I have in the middle of the slide written a circle around A, and I've called it not A, because it, is, it indeed is not A in the world that we've been constructing just now. If A was marked, it would be a single circle, and a circle around a circle vanishes it, and it becomes not marked. So a circle around marked is not marked, and a circle around not marked is marked. So the not interchanges marked and unmarked or a single circle and blank space. So I could return to the liar paradox in this formalism and write L equals L circle. And then if L was marked, then it becomes that L is unmarked. And if L is unmarked, it becomes that L is marked. And how would we solve L equals L with a circle around it? The equation L equals L with a circle around it has a somewhat different sense than L equals not L, which is back a slide. Never mind, it's too far back. But once we've translated into this geometric language, this cartooned language, then you think that L seems to be sitting inside its own indicational space in the inner space. Um, so it becomes a form of self-reference. We think of the circle as having to do with observation. It's a fixed point for putting a circle around it and maybe a recursion. So all those views <coughs> about, about uh, the liar paradox are coming out of, of playing with this language in this way. So I want to use that as an excuse to digress in the direction of recursion and self-reference. I could also have drawn a picture, but I think I didn't put it in this slideshow, of an infinite nest of circles going down forever. And then if you put one more circle around it, it wouldn't change it geometrically. Um, here's a cartoon that I like in the form of a photograph. And now we're thinking about self-reference and perception. Of course, you may have different thoughts than I about this picture, but 
it is um, a nice uh, a nice discussion that the photographer has created for us because this device is photographing a part of its own connection to the world uh, and showing us the image. It isn't actually showing itself the image because it doesn't have that much structure. But of course, you could imagine machinery that's uh, able to make discriminations in the world. And if the machinery could make uh, uh, a good body of discriminations, then it could begin to make discriminations about its own interrelationship with the world. And then such machinery may appear conscious to us eventually. Another cartoon I like, the regress, the infinite nest of circles here. And in all these cases, there's this theme of the form re-entering its own indicational space, as we had L equals L with a circle around it, or this stylized form where um, the mark is set to a point into its own inner space. And if it, I did have the nest of circles, if the mark points into its inner space, uh, you could imagine an infinite nest, purely spatial, of marks. And then when you put one more mark around it, it will be the same, up to the usual idea of shifting an infinite set. Or you could think of it as going on in time, and in time it will build first a mark, then a mark within a mark, and a mark within that, and so on, building that way. And then I think something I did not put in this slide is that if this square is, if this square satisfies the rules of our formal system with circles, then the first one is marked and the next one is unmarked because two circles make nothing. And the next one is marked because the two inner circles cancel and you're just left with a mark. And the next one is unmarked. And so in time, if evaluated, uh, this uh, re-entering form oscillates between being marked and unmarked. Like that, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, and minus. And you can even think of uh, some mathematical objects like the square root of minus one as being in the form of such a discrete oscillation. I point this out to you for the sake of connecting to other things. If I write i is equal to minus 1 over i and wonder whether i could be real, I could try i equals 1. Uh, but then minus 1 over 1 is minus 1. And if I try minus 1, then I get 1. So i squared equals minus 1 has the form of the liar paradox. But of course, we understand how to keep it from being a paradox in many ways. And in fact, it leads to um, entire field of mathematics and many connections with many other things. So a paradox might find its right context. On encountering, re-entering, and reflexive structures, we leave the simple dualities for a complex world. And once this sort of pattern sets in, it is a challenge to go back to the beginning. This is a cartoon due to John Wheeler, the physicist, about going back to the beginning. Um, this is Wheeler's U for universe, and the universe is observing itself, and it is observing uh, near the Big Bang, which is over there on the right-hand part of the letter. You see the Big Bang has occurred uh, to create the letter. The letter, the letter is expanding up into the observer on the left. Um, and Wheeler liked to um, talk about this cartoon uh, because uh, it is a quantum paradox. In quantum theory, a phenomenon in, in the classical interpretation of quantum theory, in the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory, a phenomenon is a not a real phenomenon until it is actual, until there's actually an observation. A phenomenon becomes actual upon observation and is, not re and is only regarded as in the possible uh, before an observation is made. 
So what about the universe itself? The universe presumably emerges from the Big Bang and grows and eventually becomes possible for it to observe itself. And what was the status of the universe before the observation occurred? It was entirely in the possible according to the classical quantum mechanics. But you might find that a little disturbing. And of course, there are much subtler aspects of self-reference that we can't easily speak about. Now I'm shifting into some statements, and then I'll go back to playing with mathematics again. One can be aware of one's own thoughts. An organism produces itself through its own productions in an environment. A market is composed of individuals whose actions influence the market, just as the actions of the market influence the, these individuals. The participant is an observer, but not an objective observer. There is no objective observer. There is no objective observer. Whoop. Um, oh, um, everything. Okay? I flicked. I flicked something on my screen. How are you guys doing? I haven't been watching you. No, no, we're good. <laughs> uh, but I, I flicked to the uh, the the rogues gallery here for a moment. By ah, okay. Uh, and of course, you didn't see that, right? No. There's no objective observer, and yet objects, repeatability, a whole world of actions and a reality to be explored arise in this reflexive domain. Another Escher drawing there. Now, here's a mathematical one, which I like. Uh, we'll spend a few minutes on this one. I like this very much. This is about describing, describing. And if I said, well, why don't you think about the theme of describing, describing, and how that works, how recursively we are acting on our own language and uh, and always, always acting on our own language and acting on our concepts with our concepts and so on. You could think of lots of examples that have nothing to do with mathematics uh, or that have a lot to do with mathematics. But uh, one of the purest examples of describing, describing is, um, is, a, is a gadget that was um, invented or found by John Conway. I think Conway denies that he uh, discovered this uh, sequence but um, he certainly analyzed it more deeply than anyone before. It's a puzzle. Um, I'm, I'm going to begin with one entity, star, and, and just the language of the numbers one, two, three, okay? And I'm going to be describing, describing in relation to star. I begin with star and I say one star and I write it down in my language, one star. Now I describe that, one, one, one star. Then I describe that, three ones, one star. And then I describe that, one, three, two ones, one star. So you see the, you see how this goes, right? Um, I'm, I'm always scribing into my very small language of one, two, three, and star, uh, the result of the previous description. So I get a sequence of numbers, if you like, uh, I have a star at the end. You could start with a number for star if you wished. Um, and this goes on forever, and, uh, and the patterns are quite complex. And in fact, uh, if you look at this uh, chart here, uh, you see 111 star and go down three, and you see an extension of 111 star to 111312211 star. And then you go down three, and you see an extension of that. And this is, in fact, the case. Uh, and you might have to do a little puzzling to uh, convince yourself of this, that as you go down three any time in this sequence, you get an extension of what you had three above. So that means that you could start with the triple one, for example, and turn it into an infinite sequence by just looking at this extension that goes on forever. And then below it, the next one, an infinite sequence, and the next one, an infinite sequence. And you obtain three sequences such that B describes A. It does. Look at B. 
I'll read B while you look at A. Look at A, I'll read B. Three ones, one three, two ones, three twos, one one, one three, three ones, two threes, two ones, three threes, and so on. I, I think I got off by one. Three ones, one three, one one, two twos, two ones, one three. Yeah, okay, right? It's working. So B describes A, C describes B, and A describes C. So it goes round in a three and a triplet, each of them describing the other. Like the Borromean rings, which I've drawn in the middle, the link such that each one uh, surrounds one of the others in a triplet. And in the case of the Borromean rings, you need all three of them. If you were to remove one of them, the other two would fall apart. I don't know what removing one of these would mean. So this is an example of um, how describing describing which is part of what we do all the time in thought and language um is incredibly powerful uh and if you apply it to even the simplest mathematical situations gives rise to um mysterious and enormous kinds of complexity it's something to think about uh even this situation with the so-called audio active sequence is um hard to fathom fully. Here's the Borromean rings, uh, uh, a larger picture of them. Uh, you will notice that blue surrounds green, green surrounds red, and red surrounds blue. So it goes round in a three like that. Um, the, link, the rings are linked, uh, and uh, it takes some work to prove mathematically that the rings are linked. It isn't quite enough to say that each one surrounds the other to uh, be convinced mathematically that they are linked. They are a threefold relation. Um, that is, you need all three of them in order for the relationship to occur. Uh, it isn't binary anymore. Um, uh, I'm uh, now digressing into a little bit of knot theory as we head in towards the end of this talk. Um, here is a trefoil knot, and um, and and here it's linked with itself. Um, and how it's linked with itself is also kind of mysterious. Um, you make a, a knot by making a loop in a rope, and then you bring the end of the rope down through the loop in order to lock it, and you have to do it in the right way, and then attach the ends together, and you end, end up with this topological entity, a trefoil knot, which won't go away without breaking or cutting it. I've indicated something else that I won't go into in the talk except to mention it, I've indicated a way to understand the topology of the trefoil knot by making a certain kind of distinction. In this case, it's a threefold distinction. I have drawn, I have colored one of the arcs green, one of the arcs blue, and one of the arcs red. The arcs go from undercrossing to undercrossing. Red, you'll notice, starts at under, goes across and ends at under. Blue starts at another under and goes across and ends at under, and so with green. And if you start, if you take as a rule that you shall have three colors at a crossing or else only one, you could imagine red, red, red at a crossing. That's a rule for a game to play in, in drawing other pictures of the knot. Then you will find that the threeness, the three coloredness persists no matter what you do to the knot. And it is that threeness persisting that can be used to um, verify or come to the conclusion that the trefoil knot could never be changed into an unknot. For an unknot, as an unknotted single circle, would have only one color by the rules of this game. Another way of thinking about the knots is as forms, they're independent of the substrate that they car that carries them. I could have a knot on hemp or a knot on cotton, and I could have cotton turning into hemp and slide the knot along, and it would still have the same form, but it would have a different substrate. So this is related to that 
dictum from uh, a while back that the f that um, we take the form of distinction for the form. The knot is an example of a of a pattern which um, is independent of the substrate on which it lives, and yet you wouldn't have a knot if you didn't have some substrate in order to support it. And in mathematics, we support it with mathematical substrates of various kinds, curves in space. Um, but in in the world, you may support it with a rope or some field that is knotted, lots of possibilities. Uh, I am uh, going to skip some things here, um, but I'll give you a, a little look-see at them while I do them too quickly. Uh, I like to play with the formalism of the knots and turn it into a kind of set theory, where an underline is a member of the overline. It's very simple. And then we can do cartooning of set theory using knot diagrams. And uh, you see that in such cartoons, you would have self-membership, because a line could curl around like that and be a member of itself. And you can also have mutuality, where A goes under B, and B goes under A, and that's a link. Uh, and you have sets that are mutually creating each other in that way. So you have a, a, a different model of set theory coming out of this form of cartooning. But you also have the old counting as well. Zero is the empty set. It has nobody going under it. One is the set which has only zero going under it. Two is the set which has zero and one going under it. And three, the set which has zero, one, and two going under it, and so on. Um, or you could think about another paradox, Russell's paradox. A is a member of A in the left, but topologically, I removed the self-membership, and A is not a member of A. So you have an equal opportunity uh, attitude towards self-membership in this not set theory like that. Um, but now I want to talk about, as we are coming towards the end, I want to talk about uh, some relationships with ideas about particles. So here's Spencer Brown's mark again, this time written as a right angle bracket instead of a circle. That's the way he liked to write it. And it interacts with itself in the two ways, either producing nothing, cross over cross equals nothing, or producing itself, mark next to mark is equal to mark. But now I want to think of it as a kind of elementary particle that has two ways of interacting with itself. It can interact with itself to annihilate itself and become nothing. It is its own antiparticle. Or it could interact with itself to produce itself, condense to itself. If you made a particle diagram interaction picture cartoon, it would look like this. P interacts with P to produce P, or P interacts with P to produce star, where star is the um, unmarked particle, the nothing. And um, back to circles, it would be the same. Um, but if you think of circles interacting, uh, then you can imagine these interactions in a geometrical way as well. Um, I could have two circles which are forming a surface by going through a saddle point, and they become one. Um, and if you slowed that down slice by slice in the world line of the two circles interacting in the form of a, of a saddle, surface on the left, you would see two circles coming together, sharing a bit of boundary, canceling the bit of boundary, and becoming one. Um, or you could think of two circles going through a saddle point and becoming a single circle, and the single circle disappears. Or you could think of two concentric circles where the outer concentric, the outer circle comes eventually just into contact with the inner circle, and they do each other in. Uh, and that looks like another surface, a uh, kind of a vase with an inner vase. So you can make geometrical pictures of these particle interactions. And a particle that interacts with itself to either produce itself or annihilate itself is called a Majorana particle. A Tori Majorana conjectured the existence of such particles that are their own antiparticles in the 1930s. Uh, he thought perhaps the neutrino, uh, uh, or it has been thought that the neutrino might be a Majorana particle. Um, but then more recently, um, Majorana particles have been um, understood as 
uh, so-called quasi-particles in collectivities of electrons. And uh, it is also the case that mathematically, and I won't do it in the talk, one can think of the electron as a kind of composite of two Majorana particles. And so the idea of Majorana particle is um, quite interesting these days. And the mark as a formalism is a logical particle with these properties. And uh, I wanted to show you some kinds of, a couple of things about such particles. Um, so I have PP can decompose, I mean, can compose, as it were, into either P or nothing, right? So I could write this as an equation. Uh, P interacting with P equals P plus star, where the plus now means or, really, um, but it's written in an arithmetical way, or. And I say this reflects the golden mean and the Fibonacci numbers. This is for your amusement. Interacting P with itself. I let P interact with itself and I get P plus star. I let it interact one more time and you see I get P and P and star and P, but star and P is P. And P and P is P and star. And together that collects up to two Ps and a star. And you do it one more time, you get three Ps and two stars, five Ps and three stars, eight Ps and three star, eight Ps and five stars, misprint, 13 Ps and eight stars, and so on. You generate the Fibonacci numbers. Uh, the equation, if you thought of it as an equation numerically of P squared equals P plus one, corresponds to the proportions of a golden rectangle. You could divide by um, uh, P and you would get that, um, that I divided by P is P minus I divided by I. And those that corresponds to the poor proportions of the rectangle you're looking below, where you can think of I as the vertical length, sorry, not labeled, and P as the horizontal length. And the ratio of the horizontal length to the vertical length is P. That's the uh, proportion of the large rectangle. But being golden means that the smaller rectangle obtained by cutting a square from the larger has the same proportions. And the uh, proportions of that are smaller to larger, I to P, is the same as smaller to larger in the, in the rectangle on the right. The rectangle on the right is P minus I. We removed I and divided by I. So you have the equation I is to P as P minus I is to I, one. Um, and that's the same as p squared equals p plus one. And the solution to that quadratic is one plus the square root of five over two, the golden ratio. So um, so the uh, self-interacting particle that produces itself or else nothing uh, is closely related to the geometry of the golden rectangle and to the Fibonacci numbers. And uh, this uh, looks like recreational math related to the first distinction from one side but on the other hand, this primitive Fibonacci particle takes part in mathematical physics models that can be used for universal topological computation and for studying certain topological problems. The actuality of such applications depends upon emerging physics of um, the way electrons behave in cold plates and in the way electrons may behave in nanowires and other things like this. But what you see here is that the boundary between the most elementary mathematics and that elementary mathematics is right next to the question of what is the relationship between our mathematics and and ourselves and our mind and our ability to discriminate and the mathematics is directly related to discrimination and distinction on the one hand and ends up being related to um, uh, some of the most interesting emerging physics at the same time. So uh, there's a lot to think about here in that regard. Um, I think, given the amount of time we have, that this is a good place to stop rather than go on and show you more slides.